The message this morning is on the life of Moses. We've entitled this series, Face to Face. Someone from our congregation will read the scripture, will jump into the message, and we pray that this will be a great encouragement and help to you. Scripture reading this morning is found in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. It says, from Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone... He would look at the bronze serpent and live. Well, it wasn't too long ago that I was down at a place called Glen Erie Navigators. Have you heard of that? Uh, the castle down um, not far from Colorado Springs. And I was speaking at a pastor's conference. And we had sessions in the morning and the evening. But the afternoons were free. So I decided to take a hike up the mountain. And beautiful day and uh, started off pretty cool and crisp. We got to the top and sat there and just prayed and looked around, spent some time with the Lord. And then I thought, well, I'm going to head on down. It got a little hotter in the afternoon. And so I just started traipsing on down. It's a lot quicker coming down and going up. And uh, so I'm looking in front of me, making sure I don't misstep, fall off the side of the mountain. And I'm going on down and I, I just navigating my way, and I go to step over a stick, and it rattles <laughs> and uh, coils up and strikes at me. And I can tell you this, my heart rate was already high, <laughs> but that just does something to you. Um, Indiana Jones, he, he, one of my favorite lines, I hate snakes. <clears throat> I don't know about you, you may like snakes. I know some people like snakes, they have them as pets. I hate snakes. And I think back to when I was, even in high school, I was working at a summer camp and I was, one of my responsibilities was taking care of the horses. We had about 20 horses that we were to get into the barn, into the stalls, and I was working one day. And all of a sudden, these horses just went berserk. And, and I thought, I'm going to die. I'm going to die because we're in the middle of the barn. There's a concrete floor, and they are jumping over each other and crashing into walls, breaking things. And um, it was a snake. It was just a harmless black snake. But what was, seemed harmless was going to become harm, harm, uh, harmful uh, to the horses, to everybody else. And of course, we had rattlesnakes around. You're, you look... If you're, you're a hiker, you probably think about that periodically. Well, today we have a story about snakes. And if you are celebrating St. Patrick's Day, which I hope you read up on who St. Patrick was, because incredible, incredible evangelist and to Ireland. What was one of the things that they said he did? He drove all the snakes out of Ireland. Now, I don't know if that's true, um, but that sounds like a good idea for any place. <laughs> so here's, here's the story that takes place. We've been following the children of Israel as Moses has led them out of Egypt, and they're going to the promised land. And 40 years ago, they got there ready to go in, and they decided they weren't going to do it. Fear overtook them, not faith. And so... They were really punished by turning back and wandering for 40 years. So 40 years have passed. Now again, they're ready to go into the promised land. They're getting ready. 
for this big event. We hope that this will happen. And they start complaining, griping, whining, murmuring, mumbling about the food. Now, you think about that. They ate the same thing for 40 years. The manna, as good as it was, that sweet, flaky thing that they had, is wonderful 40 years ago. But when you eat that for 40 years, uh, they got to the place where they started complaining. And it just really defines their lives. If you, really, if you, if you walk through this whole journey, they're always complaining. And so here's what the Lord did. It says, the Lord sent, not the devil sent, the Lord sent fiery serpents. And they bit people and they died. Now, fiery, we're not sure if that they were flaming, but I think they were stinging uh, serpents, probably a viper, an adder, or a cobra. Uh, all of those are in that area. But these weren't just scary to look at and unnerve you and make your heart rate go, go up. Uh, these were attacking people. Now, I know the question we have is, how could a loving God <laughs> do such a thing or allow such a thing? And we struggle with a lot of those issues. We're going to kind of get into that here in a little bit. But it was just terrible, terrifying for these people. Can you imagine this? If, if in this room all of a sudden there are poisonous snakes going everywhere, biting people, how you'd feel, the chaos that would, would come along with that. Now, in Lafayette, we don't have that many people die of snake bites each year. But worldwide, last year, 138,000 people died of snake bite. That's a lot of people. So... You live in Asia and in India and in Africa. There are a lot of poisonous snakes and they end people's lives. So why do we have this story? Well, it's an event and we're chronicling events. We're in numbers. Um, all first, the five books will we'll see stories that kind of intersect together. Uh, why does God give us this story? And in the New Testament, we point back to this, and there are reasons given. The first is this. In 1 Corinthians 10, 9 to 11, it says, But we must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. So he makes reference to this. But it, it doesn't say they put God to the test. They put Christ to the test. To the test. Remember I told you Christ is throughout all the Old Testament and a lot of times we don't see it. You start looking to see how it, it coincides with everything that is written in the New Testament. And it, and it says, they, nor grumble. They put him to the test. He says we should not grumble as many of them did or were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10 says, now these things happened to them as an example for us. But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages shall come. So, not only is there actual events taking place for, the, for these people, but it's not unrelated to us. He says, I've given you this as an example that you not test Christ when he's working in your own. When, when he's calling you to live by faith and enter into the promised land and to, yes, faith is hard. It's taking steps where you can't see. It's doing what you don't completely understand. But don't test him by complaining and grumbling and whining and going back to the desert, spending 40 years, and here they are again. You say, don't, don't we ever learn? Well, you would hope they would. The second passage I want to us to look at in the New Testament <clears throat> is if I, if I were to ask you what's the most uh, famous verse in all the Bible that people know more than any other Bible, what would it be? John 3.16 but listen to this 
verses 14 and 15. So 14, 15, and 16. This leads up to verse 16. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Wow. So you think, what relationship does this story in Numbers 21 have with the whole story of the gospel? Well, in the same way in the Old Testament as that bronze serpent was lifted up, so the Son of Man must be lifted up on a cross, and whoever believes in him will be saved, have eternal life. In the Old Testament, whoever believed in this bronze serpent was spared their physical life. So he ties that together and then leads right on into verse 16. So what does God want us to learn through this? To me, this is exciting because there's something here for us today. Uh, this spring in, in 2023, I see at least three lessons. The first is this, your sins are many. Your sins are many. Now, we see that in other people a lot better than we see it in ourselves. In fact, it's kind of fun pointing it out with other people. You know, I see what you did wrong there, but our sins are many. Craig has been preaching through Romans, and I'm reminded of verse 23 of chapter 3. It says, for all have sinned, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the glory of God is his standard, and everyone has come short. And here's the truth, folks. You are a sinner. You have many sins, and I do too. We're all sinners. And the fruit, we look at the, the fruit of our sin comes in many ways. Uh, we all have our specialties. <laughs> We've talked about that. You know, some things we all do, um, like put our foot in our mouth or say things we shouldn't say. Uh, we have, all have evil thoughts. We all get angry in various ways, but we all have specialties as well. So there, there are many, what I call the fruit of sin, is described by this in several places, Old Testament and New, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You may have heard that before. So I, what I call those are passions, possessions, and pride. So your passions are all the things you would crave and want, evil lusting after things, possessions wanting more to accumulate stuff that's going to fade away, and then pride, just thinking more of yourself than you ought to. It, it's amazing how selfish and self-centered we really are. Um, I know it's easy to see that in other people, but it, it, it really is amazing how much we think about self. We, we, it's just everything revolves around us. So that's kind of the fruit. The evidences are many sins. Uh, if we were to make lists, you know, get all our collective lists, what sins do we commit? It would be a lot. But there's a root. So you have the root and the fruit. The many sins that we all commit, and what's the root? It's unbelief. You don't believe God. He said to them, you go into the land and possess the land, and I will give you victory over all of your enemies. But they're giants, and they're really big. <laughs> Remember when we talked about that? And it turned them away. And so the problem at the root, you say, well, it's disobedience. But at the root, it's unbelief. I don't believe God. And the nature of faith, which we're all called to live by, is we are saved by faith and we are called to live by faith is going to test, test us. It's hard to believe what we can't see and to follow what we don't completely understand. But make no mistake, God is very clear about what we're to do. I mean, he doesn't hide it. He makes it very, very clear about what we're to do in living by faith. 
So unbelief, it's expressed, the, the, to me, the, 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 probably the most visible expression of unbelief is in gratitude. In Romans chapter 1, it talks about the, the, this kind of root problem that people had is they were not thankful. They weren't thankful for the bread. So what does that lead to? Complaining, griping, mumbling, murmuring. And, it, and it's like a poison. It poisons your own soul. It poisons everyone around you. This is what happened. They were collectively poisoning each other by their ingratitude. Now, you say, well, this, I'm glad I'm not like that. <clears throat> When's the last time you complained? I doubt you made it here this morning without complaining about something. Either saying it or thinking it or complaining. And the root is a lack of gratitude and thankfulness. You say, but there's a lot to complain about. <laughs> yes, but there's more to give thanks to God for. And, and I've shared this with you many times. For, and this is my own wrestling through my, my walk with God. When I start getting in a bad way with God, in other words, kind of getting an attitude or getting discouraged and depressed or just feeling like I'm in a funk, the best thing I can do is just go take a walk and start thanking God for everything he's done for me. Start, starting from the very beginning of my life and just chronicling every single thing I have to be thankful for. And it, does, it changes my whole mindset. It changes how I see everything. Unfortunately, I need to take that walk about every day. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Because we, we are just because of our sinful nature and because of the surrounding events of this life, we can be given to complaint and grumbling and whining. And so when they did this, the Lord sent serpents. You say, well, that's pretty, pretty severe. Um, think about this about your complaining whether it's the weather, about the situation you're in, this person that's driving you crazy at work or your neighbor, or how you feel, whatever you're complaining about, you, you follow your complaint, whatever it is, to its logical conclusion, and you are complaining against God. Oh, no, no, no. I just complained about the weather today. Who made the weather? That you follow the logical conclusion of every complaint and you are unthankful and unbelieving to God. Now, what's this whole book about? Relationship. This whole story, this whole journey, we, we've titled the series on Moses face to face. It's all about relationship. Every event is is relationship and and when you're complaining and griping and murmuring what's that doing to a relationship to your marriage to your kids to your family to your coworkers it destroys relationships so you say well that's kind of mean sin and snakes that got their attention didn't it and and you see this this is really um, an expression of the mercy of God his judgment God is just he is holy he does not tolerate sin. Sin cannot be in his presence. Whenever sin comes into your life, God gets involved because he loves you. It's not just because he wants to punish you and be mad at you and don't do that anymore. You're going to pay for that. No, he loves you and he knows that when he's trying to build that relationship and, and you don't believe him and you don't trust him and you're complaining and whining, he wants to restore relationship so he sends the snakes so in numbers 21 6 it says then the lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of israel died very simple verse in romans 6 says this the wages of sin is what death the wages 
of sin is death. Always, every sin, no matter how big or how small, the wages of sin is death. That is the reality. You say, well, I've sinned. I'm not dead. Yes, you are. You know, you, you get bit by one of those adders. I was, this, this week was kind of fun because I spent the whole week studying about snakes. <laughs> I can't put that all in my message, but it's really interesting. You know, they, some, one of them called the two-step. You know, what's the two-step? It's not a dance. It's like you've got two steps and you're dead. So as soon as that adder strikes or that viper strikes, you're dead. No, nah, i got two more steps to take. You're dead. When you sin, you're dead. It's just a matter of time. And you know what's going to happen over the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years? We're all going to be gone. Is that true? So, I mean, say, well, I don't have much to worry about. I'm so young. <laughs> you don't control that. You don't control that. You're dead the moment you sin. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. And so God and his holiness and his judgment shows you the consequence of your sin and shows you the choices that you've made. You say, well, people have sinned against me and all these things have happened to me. That's true. I mean, a lot of what we feel the effects of other people's sins against us, but it's the sins we commit, the choices, the decisions we make to say something, to do something, to neglect something that really condemns us. And so you think, okay, how could a loving God <laughs> do such a thing? And one thing is I can't explain all of it to you. I mean, I, if I tried to, I'd be making stuff up. I don't. I don't understand. But I do know the fundamental point is that he never punishes someone who doesn't who hasn't had a chance i believe god is is fair he's just and he's good and he gives opportunity but the, the bite of the serpent is showing you what you need to see you are a sinner you have committed many sins and you are dying in your sins that's, he's letting you know that because he loves you and that you can look and live. So what are the people to do? They need help. He's exposed their need and he has created. This is what God does. He creates a way of salvation. And this is our third point. Um, your salvation is here. Your salvation is here. That's why we say the bad news, good news. But somehow we, we don't like telling people bad news. They don't see any need for the good news. And it's part of preaching the whole counsel of God, the whole gospel. As people are sent, you know, you look around society, people are snake bitten. And they're dying. And there's hope. And there's salvation. It is here. So they're in a panic. You can imagine the panic. Uh, we went down to Table Rock Lake in Missouri. We do go every, every uh, summer with our kids and Diane's family. So get a pontoon boat and swim off the boat. And we found a rock, and the kids are all swimming off the rock, getting up on the rock, jumping off. And, and um, all of a sudden, someone screams, Sarah, she's probably junior high at the time, she's on the edge of the rock getting ready to jump, and she said, there's a snake crawling up <laughs> right next to her. She just goes crazy and screams and actually swims on top of the water all the way to the boat. I said, what are you doing? The snake jumps in the water. The other kids jump in the water. Snake's in the water. I mean, it was hysteria. <laughs> it was absolutely, and people are screaming what to do. The kids... You know, you can imagine the panic. And this is, this is, if you try to take yourself back to Numbers 21 and imagine what it, would be, what it would be like to have snakes everywhere 
biting people. I hope I don't give you nightmares tonight. I'm not, I'm not trying to do that. I hope that we can find the remedy here. So what's the solution? You get bit by a snake. Um, well, see the doctor, see the nurse, <clears throat> see the specialist. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of advice givers with home remedies and someone selling essential oils. Um, maybe it's a special diet or exercise, or maybe if you do this, you know, that, and this is the way we are. When we're dying in our sins and we need salvation, we will turn to everything else except what God says. Because we're going to figure it out. Well, I know I, my brother-in-law is a doctor. <clears throat> I know someone who's been through this before. We all have experience, all have advice. Those of you know what I'm talking about when you get sick and everybody <laughs> tries to heal you. Medicines, vitamins, family remedies. In Numbers 21, 7 and 9, it says, And so the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us, so Moses prayed to the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look to the bronze serpent and live. So, this is really what we would call repentance and faith. They recognize, you know, I've sinned, I'm turning from my sin, I'm turning. Moses is the intercessor on behalf of the people that have gone to Moses. God intervenes, and they do something which seems a little bit shocking, <laughs> okay? Because if you, he, he's just got finished giving in the Ten Commandments, don't make any idols, and so... You think, what's the deal with the bronze snake? Which, which ended up being a problem for them later. It does seem a bit bizarre to take a pole and make a bronze serpent on the pole and put it up and look at that. If you look at that, then you'll be healed. Doesn't it seem bizarre? Kind of shocking that you would put a, a serpent on the pole? But no less shocking than putting the Son of God on a cross who became a curse for us. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 1, it talks about it's, it's foolishness to the world. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who do not believe. But unto us which are saved is the power of God, the salvation. So when you think about this, it, it does seem shocking and bizarre and I think God does do shocking and bizarre things to get our attention. One, the snake bite. <laughs> okay, you can try everything else and die, or you can look. I mean, just look, and that is so humbling to us. We don't like to just look and live. We want to go do something. We want to feel good about ourselves. I want to accomplish something. I want to know something. When you look, it's just like this simple Faith. It's like, I've done nothing. I've done nothing. And that's, that's really what salvation is. James Montgomery Boyce, a preacher of the last century, said, the bronze serpent is a great example of how God saves sinners. So we have that in Numbers 21. In John 12, 32, here's what Jesus said. See if you can tie this together. He said, he said and I, when I am lifted up, from the earth will draw all people to myself. What's he talking about? He's lifted up on the cross. He will draw all people to himself. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we've been bitten by a deadly serpent, 
we are dead. There's one antidote. There's one antidote. Just like the serpent in the Old Testament, one antidote. The cross in the New Testament, one antidote. Jesus is the only way. This is something that uh, I think we struggle with. But there, there is a verse in Isaiah 45, 22. And it says this, it says, look unto me, look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved. For I am God, and there is none else. How simple. How simple. Isn't that a picture of faith, of believing? So the story is told of Charles Spurgeon. He's probably one of the great preachers of the last 500 years. Um, before he was famous and knew that, he, as a 16-year-old, his life was absolutely miserable. And he was searching. Some of you know what that's like. I, I, I can remember being 16 and miserable. I was longer, it was longer for me. He was a miserable guy, and he was searching. He just wanted an answer. And, and one Sunday morning, he decided to go to church. And it started snowing. And a huge snowstorm hit that part of England. And he never made it to the church he was going to. But he ended up in a primitive Methodist church. That makes you kind of wonder what that might have been like. He goes into the building, and because of the snowstorm, there are only like 15 people in this building. And the pastor couldn't make it. So the guy that was speaking was uneducated. Back in that time, he had a lot of people that never had any schooling. He was probably a, a shoemaker or just had regular job. And so he had the, the responsibility to stand up and preach. And so he preaches from this text, Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be saved all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none, none else. Now what's going to be, what is an uneducated man going to say? Here's what he said. He said, look unto me, I'm sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me, I am hanging on the cross. Look unto me, I am dead and buried. Look unto me, I rise again. Look unto me, I ascend to heaven. Look unto me, I am sitting at the Father's right hand. Oh, poor sinner, look unto me, look unto me. And he ran out of things to say. <laughs> and then he looks over at Charles Spurgeon. There are not many people sitting there. 15 people or so. And he says, young man, you look miserable. Can you imagine that? And he says, all you need to do is look to Christ. Look, 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 and be saved. And that's the day that Charles Spurgeon trusted Christ as a savior. It's to me, an incredible story. So, you step back in chapter 21. What's our takeaway from this? Well, three lessons. One, your sins are many. Two, your judgment is severe. And three, your salvation is here. It is now. Look. And the application, I, as I close, I just want to make... Two simple applications. One, for those that have never put their faith and trust in Christ as Savior. And for those of us that have. First of all, Christ is calling us to personal faith in Jesus. Salvation. Salvation. Eternal life. And so what, what does it take when, he, when he's teaching about this, what does it take to be genuinely saved or to have authentic faith? And historically, theologians have agreed on these three elements. And I, and I, want, I want to make these really clear. One is knowledge or content. You can't believe in what you don't know. So that's why we have the scripture. It, it tells us, look, 
look, so we, we have the information, we hear it, we know it. If you don't know it, if you don't know about this, you cannot have faith. Number two is assent. So you have content, you have assent or agreement. I agree. I agree. Because in your heart that you agree this is true and this is right. There's so many people today that um, are like what it says about in James, the devil, the devils believe. They tremble. I believe there's a God. So if someone says, I've always believed. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in the cross. I've always believed in God. I've gone to church. I always believe. I'm a Christian. No, you're not. No, you're not. Because mental assent, you know, knowing the facts and ascending to agreeing that that is true is still missing this third part, which is commitment. Or we might say confession. I acknowledge this by putting my faith and trust in Jesus, and I confess with my mouth. Here's what it says in Romans 10. It says, if we believe in our heart, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So three parts to this. I want you to see that this is very important for you and for those you explain this to. One is you know the gospel. Two is you agree with the gospel. And three is that you commit your life to the gospel of Christ. And I still believe our churches are filled with people who've never done that. They, they agree, they, they go, they don't deny anything, but they've never personally said, God save me. I got bit, I'm dying, I look, I believe, I trust you as my savior. Those three parts are the, or those elements are key. And so I beg you, I plead with you today. Don't let your pride get in the way. Well, I, maybe I think, I think I did that. But don't think, no, no. Don't think you're going to heaven. Don't think you got the right antidote. I think that's the right antidote for this the snake bite. No, don't think. No, you can know. These things I've written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. It would break my heart to think of someone here that listens every week to us preaching to not know and to die in your sins. You know, you agree, you cry out to him to save you. Right there, right on your seat, right now. You don't even need to close your eyes. He knows your heart. Just cry out to him, say, Lord, I believe. I trust you as my savior. I know it, I agree with it, I confess you. And as soon as we're done with church, tell somebody. <laughs> Get over your pride. I think a lot of people go to hell because of their pride. Well, I think in Sunday school, I think I, I think I might have done, you know, I've been baptized. I think, no, 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 no. You know it, you agree, you confess. Now, to Christians, this is my second part of my application. <laughs> I don't have the answers for all the world's problems, and you don't either. How many people do you know right now who have been bitten by snakes who are dying in their sins, are miserable, are crying out. You don't need to come up with all the ingenious ideas of how to solve their problems. Don't get intimidated. Just say, look. That's all you got to do. Say, look. Look. Look nothing about me or what I'm going to teach you or some book I'm going to give you. Just look. Wow, that should give us boldness, shouldn't it? This time of year, Easter coming up, all we got to tell people is look, all, all around you people are dying in their sins. Lord, give me the opportunity to just point someone 
and tell him what he's done for me. Let's bow our heads and I'll close in prayer. Um, I really, I'm not going to do this every Sunday, but and I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm not going to ask for you to come forward. Or I'm not going to embarrass you public. But if you have never really settled this about your salvation, would you do that right now? Would you, would you just do that right now? All you need to do is just in your heart say, Lord, I understand the gospel, that I'm a sinner, I'm dead, I'm dying. And the only hope is Christ. That you sent your son to die on the cross for God so loved the world. That's what it leads, in, leads into, doesn't it? Just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the, that's the whole story. Right now, just call on him. Say, Lord, I trust you as my Savior. I believe I receive you into my heart. Thank you. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. Now, for those of you that have done that, I don't want you to doubt that because it's not your great prayer that got it done. <laughs> it's his mercy that got it done. If you've cried out to him before for salvation, then you're saved and there's nothing in the world that will ever take that away from you. However, I want to challenge you as a believer that you know people, family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers, they're all around you, who have been bitten by the serpent and are dying. And God will put someone in your heart in the next couple of weeks to be able to say, look and live. Look and live. How simple. I tell you what, this story, yes, it's about the judgment of God, but the bigger story is the great mercy and kindness of God who sent his son. And yes, it was shocking to see him on that cross, that pole, so to speak, <clears throat> but it changed the world. It'll change your life.